May we take the next few moments and open ourselves up to the presence of God here in our midst as we listen to the music of the prelude. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Let us be glad in it. It's good to be here in this time and in this place. While I go through our announcements, I would ask that you find the red friendship pad at the end of your pew and sign your name to that, then pass that down the row and pass it back from where it began, making note of those worshiping around you. We'll be greeting one another in a few moments. While you do that, I'll highlight for us, we have an exploring membership class on June the 11th. If you are interested in learning more about who we are and what we do here at the Gettysburg Presbyterian Church, this is the class for you, after which, if you are so inclined, you would be invited and, uh, and you, to unite in membership with our congregation. So information about that. We have a congregational meeting coming up on Sunday, June the 4th, following the 11 a.m. service. Put that on your calendar and please plan to attend. Children's Church, we have a sign-up opportunity out in the fellowship hall. We need uh, adults to sign up and uh, be with our children. Our children are in worship and then at a certain point they, uh, they exit the sanctuary and they go to continue their Christian education during our worship hour, during the worship hour. Um, and we like to just release them with an adult or two, not just to have free range of the entire uh, church. Not that anything would ever get broken or anything as a result of that, uh, but just that we have folks that would go with them and have a lesson that they would go through together. And it gives the, our children a chance to experience worship, uh, to learn about that, but then to go off and learn more about their faith. And we really are in need of folks to sign up for that, so please stop by the table out in Fellowship Hall to do that. Uh, we also have Sunday school teachers we're recognizing this morning. We'll learn more about that later in the service. Our Vacation Bible School is happening again this summer. Registrations have begun. Forms were in newsletters. They're out on the table in Fellowship Hall as well. Stop by there for more information. 
And we also have uh, June 16th, we have the chip in for Chrisland Golf Tournament coming up at the Mountain View Golf Club in Fairfield, Pennsylvania. There are forms on the table in Fellowship Hall. I used up all my golf jokes last week. Nobody laughed, so I'm going to use one of them again. Just laugh, and you won't hear it for three Sundays in a row, I promise. If you're on the golf course and a lightning storm starts up, you know what you do. You hold up your one iron. Why do you hold up your one iron? Because even God can't hit a one iron. <laughs> we need a sign that just says like laugh, like a laugh track and then applause. And um, it, it, All right, you know what? I'm just going to stop because it's really not um, happening. But come on out to Chrislin and support them through that golf tournament. Um, we had a mission trip happened this, uh, just a few weeks ago to South Carolina, and some good things happened there, and so we want to find out what, they, what happened there. So, Jerry, I invite you to come on up. Good morning. I have to warn you that not all the people that you might see in these slides uh, that you might know. Uh, there are three young men uh, who are uh, the Habitat employees, and then there's Grumpy. He's uh, in the red shirt, the older uh, uh, tall gentleman, um, and he's a retired gentleman who uh, shows up every Tuesday and, uh, and one of our uh, Several of our pictures have him in it, and he's a big help. But on Sunday, April 23rd, at 6.05 uh, p.m., uh, five uh, souls set out uh, for the 11-hour trip to Charleston. It's Bonnie Wright, Tom Piper, uh, Kenton Arnold, Ellie, and myself. Deb uh, Meckley and uh, Sharon Baker uh, had uh, left a couple days earlier and were at the house and had dinner prepared for us when we arrived on Sunday evening. The experience of working on a Habitat uh, for, for Humanity house is very rewarding and life-changing. But before we get into that, uh, a little background might be in order. Uh, Tom? 75% of the people on Jones Island cannot afford to buy what an average home sells for, $93,000. Rental properties are also very expensive. Many families live in one or two room substandard homes. To help address the high cost of homes, Habitat for Sea Island is moving toward renovating existing homes in addition to building new homes. On Monday, we had a briefing about our work and the Sea Island Habitat for Humanity. When we arrived on the work site on Tuesday, the 25th, we found that the house we were to work on is located across the cul-de-sac from the two homes we worked on last year. In this development, Habitat will have 18 homes. This home had only the subflooring on the foundation. We broke into three teams that completed the deck, made framing blocks, did prep work for the wall studs, and painted a fence. All this work was in preparation for the women's build held on the weekend we left. A group of contractors from North Carolina erected the fence and worked on the framing on Friday. Besides having, besides having sore muscles, uh, bruises, blisters, and a few cuts, uh, what did we return with? Well, special bonds that each member of the group, uh, of being with each member of the group. Knowing that yet another family in a few months will have a safe place to live. And we just paid, uh, played a small part in doing this. We each wanted to stay much longer with the Habitat crew and 
Um, we even shed a, a, a tear or two when we had to leave. We also renewed friendship with the Habitat crew with whom we had worked with uh, the previous year. But, but how can we describe the feelings in our hearts that each of us had in, for the time that we spent working together on this home? We can't, it's impossible. The folks of Habitat told us that we far exceeded uh, their expectations of what uh, we were to accomplish and wanted us back sooner, if not later. So mark your calendars for either uh, April or possibly even early June. Also, I'd like to add, in the evenings after dinner, which uh, Deb and Sharon uh, prepared uh, very excellent meals, uh, we discussed the placemats that Bonnie had put out for us. These uh, placemats had verses that um, had a direct relationship of what we were doing uh, in those days. Also, also um, Bonnie put together these following slides and, and music presentation.
Great things happened in South Carolina as folks heard the call to be the hands and feet of God at work there. There are others around you that have heard the call to be God's hands and feet right here, right now, wherever we're placed, and that's the body of Christ seated around you. Let's take a moment, stand, and greet those members in faith. Please join me in our call and response call to worship. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. We enter into a time of confession, beginning in corporate unison prayer, and then in the silent prayer of our hearts. Let us pray. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, 
what our hearts can no longer bear and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment, set us free from a past that we cannot change, open to us a future in which we can be changed, and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Please join in our call and response promise of God's pardon. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose 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 for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. I declare in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. of our members that are wearing the stars, if you will please stand. And that should include all of our children, youth, and adult Sunday school teachers, youth groups, and uh, Sunday night fellowships. Join me, if you would, in the prayer that is on the colored sheet in your bulletin. God calls us all to grow in knowledge and wisdom, to go and tell what we have seen, heard, and learned. For the last 40 weeks, our congregation has been blessed by those who were willing to prepare and teach Sunday school and youth programs. As the teachers prepared these lessons, they have been blessed by their lively encounter with God's word and your people. They have been blessed and they have been a great blessing. Bless our teachers, we pray. Infuse them and us all with an eagerness to dwell in you and your word. Help them to seek and find you in nature, in quiet reading and conversations, in outdoor activity and in other experiences, where you will lead us to summer season, our work In Jesus' name, amen. Please greet the people with the stars on and let them know how much you appreciate what they have done for our children, youth, and adults, and join us in Fellowship Hall for a reception. At this time, if there are any children ages 3 through grade 3, you are um, invited to go to Children's Church if you're so moved. Um, if we don't have anyone, that's great. If you're staying in for the service, though, and would like a children in worship bag, hold your hand up super high, and our ushers will bring one in to you. All right. And I don't think there are any here. Uh, it was their chance to have a, a, their own last children's message, but our high school seniors, are there any high school seniors here that are being recognized? Well, not seeing any, I'll simply call your attention to their names that are in the, uh, in the bulletin. Um, and what, what we've done is just let them know that we're not going to forget them. And we ask them not to forget us. And so we sort of trick them into that by giving them one of these prayer blankets from our uh, blessing, our shawl ministry team. 
that knits these together and then blesses them and prays over them and lets them know that they're not forgotten. So we're, we saw some at the 9.30 hour and some at the 8.15 hour, and those that we weren't able to see today, uh, we'll make sure that they get one of these blankets. But take note of those folks, and if you know any of them, uh, maybe drop them a note this week and let them know that you'll be thinking about them and their church family is praying for them. Now let us turn to God in a time of formal prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have promised to hear when we pray in the name of your Son. And so that's what we're doing now. We're praying. Praying for the world. Creator of all, lead us and every people into ways of justice and peace that we will respect one another in freedom and truth. Awaken in us a sense of wonder for the earth and all that is in it. Teach us to care creatively for its resources. We pray for our community. God of truth, inspire with your wisdom those whose decisions affect the lives of others, that all may act with integrity and courage. Give grace to all whose lives are linked with ours. May we serve Christ in one another and love as he loves us. We pray for our graduating seniors. We pray that you would bless them and keep them, that you would remind them that they are not forgotten by us and that we pray for them, but also, Lord, that they are not forgotten by you, that you are with them each and every day, each and every step along the way, guiding them and directing them. May they lean into your grace and your presence as they continue forward in life in this yet-to-be-known future. We pray as well this day, O God, for all those in need. You are the God of comfort and hope, and we ask that you restore all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. May they know the power of your healing love and make us willing agents of your compassion. Strengthen us as we share in making people whole. We remember those who have died and those who mourn. And we remember their families. We remember those who are ill or have upcoming medical procedures. Be with doctors and nurses, hospitals and rehabs, pre-care and post-care. May your healing miracles be worked through the gifts and healing of modern medicine. Lord, you are the one who calls us into community, and you are the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven... Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Invite our ushers to come forward for the giving and receiving of our tithes and our offerings. We give to God because God has first given to us, and we give to God with gratitude.
ever-loving and ever-giving God, we're grateful for the many good gifts you bring into our lives and ask that you take these gifts back and you send them out into the world doing that which only you can to bring light and life and love and hope into the lives these gifts encounter. And we believe it can happen because we do not pray it in our name. Rather, we pray it in your strong name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. This morning we begin a sermon series on the brief five-chapter book in the New Testament, the book of James. During this sermon series, we're also encouraging ourselves as a corporate body and as individuals to read through the book of James every day throughout the sermon series. And it's not just uh, one paragraph of the book or the text that we'll be using in worship on a given Sunday of that upcoming week, but the entirety of the book, so all five chapters. And we believe that this is an attainable goal because the Bible that I looked at in my office this week, that I counted it up on, it's a mere seven pages. So we're asking for seven pages a day, every day, between now and the end of this sermon series. And if you're like me, you thought, wow, we have a book of James in the New Testament. You're laughing, maybe, because you don't know if I'm serious or not about that. Here's the thing about the book of James. The book of James has been described as having the ability to speak to every generation of Christianity with unparalleled clarity and conviction based on the following three criteria. First, it presents an uncompromising call to reject the world's values with a consistent commitment to understand that reality for people of faith is measured by God. Now, secondly, James' teaching is rooted less in Christology, in the study of Christ, and more in theology, the study of God, thus identifying itself as among one of the most ecumenical of New Testament writings. It's able to speak to both those who profess uh, and confess Jesus as Lord and those who place their faith in the faith of Abraham. And lastly, it's the New Testament writing which most clearly yields a social ethic that is grounded in the distinct perception that the world is created and gifted by God. And as such, the book of James helps us as the gathered community of God's faithful people to be reminded and to see who we are in light of God's grace and who we are called to be and how we're called to live that out in this world as a result of this identifying grace. James wants to be clear that to be a God follower, one must also bear witness of this identification to a watching world. As one writer puts it, practice must match profession. Or as the axiom goes, if we're going to talk the talk, then we need to walk the walk. And so we begin this sermon series today in the book of James with some passages out of James chapter 1 and James chapter 5. Listen now to God's word for us this day. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Blessed is anyone who endures temptation. Such a one has stood the test and will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. No one, when tempted, should say, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. 
But one is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it. Then when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and that sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my beloved. Be patient, therefore, beloved, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious crop from the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and late rains. You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Beloved, do not grumble against one another so that you may not be judged. See, the judge is standing at the doors. As an example of suffering and patience, beloved, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Indeed, we call blessed those who show endurance. You have heard of the endurance of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. May God add God's blessing to this God's holy word. Let us pray. Ever-loving and ever-giving God, my prayer is simply this, that the words of my mouth... And the words of all our hearts would be found pleasing and acceptable to you. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I was in grade school, there were a few words that would strike fear into me. Presidential physical fitness test. Yeah. I could feel my heart race. I could feel the beads of sweat beginning to form on my brow when our PE, our physical education teacher at Radio Park Elementary School announced this, this cruel and torturous form of public education. That stretching thing they made you do, you'd sit on the ground and you'd have to lean forward as far as you could go to see your reach. I am still seeing a chiropractor today because of that. The one mile run. Oh, I could feel my hamstrings starting to, to tighten up just at the thought of it. And how many curl-ups could you do? We like to call those sit-ups, and you got 60 seconds to find out exactly how many you could do. And let's not forget the bane of my existence, the chin-ups. No, they didn't even time that one. They just made you hang there until you said, I'm done. <laughs> and then there was the shuttle run. Ah, the shuttle run, or as I like to call it, the only way they got us to clean the erasers in school. They'd set up two erasers, and you would start at one point, and you'd run to a point, and you'd pick up an eraser. You'd run back and set it down over the line, run back and pick up the second eraser, run back and cross the line, and they would time you to do this. And the results of all these physical fitness tests would determine where you placed among your peers and as an added bonus, if you placed in the top 85th percentile, based on national standards, you received the Presidential Physical Fitness Award. In 2008, that meant an 11-year-old female student had to run a mile in under nine minutes, do three pull-ups, and complete 42 curl-ups, 42 sit-ups in 60 seconds. I have looked all over the church manse, and I cannot find my presidential physical fitness award, and it's not because I lost it. When this testing would happen, the letters P.E. became to me a dreaded curse. And so today, in an attempt to rebrand P.E. away from physical education and to stay in line with our James passages, I want us to focus on patient endurance, which, by the way, is exactly what my grade school friends had to do while they waited for me to complete one chin-up. 
I think some of them are still standing there waiting to this day. You see, the early church, the early church was growing impatient, waiting for Jesus' return. They, they had heard Jesus talk about it in his life, in his ministry, and then around his death and his resurrection and during his ascension. He told his disciples that he would return for them and they would one day live with him in the glorious kingdom of God. Jesus' first followers, they thought his return was coming real soon, that it was just around the corner. They thought this ushering in of the new day was imminent, and with every passing day, they wondered about the delay. The people grew impatient. James writes this letter to a church that is struggling to wait. Repeatedly, he advises them to be patient to endure the struggles imposed upon them by the people around them, most likely referring to the persecution of the early church, to resist the temptation to give in to the ways of the world and to forgo the faith in God to which we are all called to bear witness to in this world, to patiently endure. In that brief passage from James chapter 5, we read, He talks about being patient until the coming of the Lord. He's reminding the people of exactly what it is they are awaiting. It's not some minor event. It is their hope. Jesus' return is and will be worth the wait. Using that farmer illustration, James reminds the church that it might have to wait a while. Even casual gardeners know that there are seasons when it looks as if nothing is happening with their plants. In fact, some family experts talk about how parents can teach patience to their children by growing plants together. James wants the faithful community to exercise patience like they do in their agriculture as they wait for Jesus' return. James encourages us to hold on to hope as we wait patiently. He knows that often waiting prompts within us this this wanting, this yearning to move too quickly to get to the results we want. Yet James advises the church to not give up and to not give in. Rather to wait patiently with endurance and expectation for what God will reveal. Now, we may not feel the same urgency that the early church felt about Jesus' return. Yet we do know that there have been times in our lives when we've prayed to God to act in our lives and the response seemed delayed. We've cried from the depths of our very hearts and soul and our beings the words of Psalm 22, the words we used in our call to worship, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? only to hear the sound of silence. We desire God to show up. We do not want Jesus to be late, and it feels as though we're living in a vacuum. In times such as these, the words of patient endurance, they are not what we want to hear. However, they may be what we need to hear, for they are not words spoken in a vacuum. Rather, they are words spoken to the people of God, the corporate body of Christ, the beloved community of faith. We're not alone in our patient endurance. We have each other as we wait together for what may come. And they're not passive words either. They're active words We wait with patient endurance by seeking to live out what it is we await. It's like waiting for your birthday to get here. We remember our birthday is coming by doing birthday things. It's like those families and those seniors who are getting ready for graduation. They know graduation is coming, but they're living into graduation by getting ready, doing graduation things. We make out lists of who to send cards to. We make out lists of who to invite. We decorate according to the party theme. 
James wants to teach the church about active patience. To not wait passively, to not distract ourselves by finding other things to do while we pass the time. Instead, James calls for the church to enter into the day of the coming of the kingdom of God by living the kingdom of God into existence. Beloved, he writes, do not grumble against one another. Be patient. Be patient with one another. Be patient with yourself. For James, he operates out of a royal law that comes from the corpus of Scripture. In James 2, verse 8, he talks about this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Referring back to Jesus' words. Strengthen your hearts, James writes. Now, the heart for James is his way of of understanding and referring to our human intentionality. He's instructing his readers to stay focused on the one who binds our hearts together in Christian love, as the old hymn goes. The great 14th century mystic Catherine of Siena, during a time of spiritual suffering deep within her soul, was said to have cried out in prayer during a worsening fear that God had abandoned her. She cried out, Where were you when my heart was so tormented? To which she heard the reply, I was in your heart. May we patiently endure together. As we await an unfolding future, as we actively live into this yet-to-be-written future, and may we do so by never forgetting our call into community. May we be guided by God. May we be undergirded by the grace of the Holy Spirit and the power of Christ. As we listen, For that still, small voice of God which declares, You are not alone. I am with you. Hold on. And if you can't see me, look to the beloved community of faith which surrounds you. And if you are not in need of that beloved community of faith right now, then may we be that beloved community of faith for those who need it right now. Amen and amen.
go from this place knowing the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit with us each and every day, each and every step of the way, world without end. Alleluia and amen.